Dr. Leroy Hood says we may not recognize our healthcare system a decade from now. Innovation will make it more predictive, personalized, preventative, and participatory, his four Ps. And through Dr. Hood's systems-based approach, we'll be focused far more on wellness than on care. That's just one reason why he was recognized by President Obama with one of the highest awards in the land, the National Medal of Science. That's also why Dr. Leroy Hood of the Institute for Systems Biology joins our exclusive list, The Innovators. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Well, Dr. Leroy Hood, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, so, biology, we all have taken in, in high school. I actually did not, and I really feel very guilty about it after reading up on you. But what it would be the difference fundamentally between biology as we all understand it and systems biology? Uh, systems biology is about complexity. It's about looking at all of the elements that are present in a system and seeing their relationships and how they interact with one another to create uh, a smile, a thought, um, how you digest your food. Everything in biology is wrapped in an enormous amount of complexity because Darwinian evolution is a random and chaotic process and it doesn't do things efficiently, it does just things that work. So systems biology is about figuring out how to unravel this complexity. And my understanding that when you're talking, when you're looking about at these various systems, it's both systems internally, say we're talking about our body and, and our genes, and external, all the environmental factors around that and how those two collide and collaborate. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, if you're to understand disease, there are two things we really have to know. One, we have to know about our genome and how that contributes to what we are. But two, the environment impinges upon us in many ways, and we have to understand how that environment changes the basic digital signal of our genome. See, so sorry, it's, it's a real challenge to put those two things together. That's remarkable to me. I mean, it seems to me that, so we probably focus more on the internal when we were taking high school biology. Is there a case to be made that we should be learning systems biology even in high school, for example? Uh, there is, and we're actually, we have modules now for freshman biology that in four succinct sessions can teach you the principles of systems biology, and it's been widely adopted in, uh, in uh, 10 different states now. That's great, because I think, I know we're talking specifically about medicine and biology in this situation, but this whole notion of systems and ecosystems and environment, it seems to me that we're actually having that conversation largely in society now when we're looking at how we interact with networks, both the networks that surround us physically and, and physiologically, as well as our social networks when we're talking about using computers and how we interact with people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, to give you a really good analogy, suppose you wanted to figure out how a radio worked. What would you do? You'd take all the parts out, you try and see what the parts did individually, and that's what biology has done for the last 40 years, looking at one gene or one protein. But you wouldn't have the faintest idea how that radio worked until you put the parts together in a circuit and you studied the circuits individually and collectively and said, uh, determined how they changed the radio waves and the sound waves. Your body has circuits, they're called biological networks, and systems biology studies those networks in the same way. We take them apart, we understand their components, we put them together, and we see how they operate under normal circumstances and under disease circumstances. It seems so sort of obvious now, but I imagine that you actually had to invent this, this, this approach a few decades ago and actually convince people that we had to look at things more systemically. Was that ever a challenge in terms of thinking that this had to be more of a multidisciplinary approach to doing these things? Oh, it was. And in fact, uh, I started thinking about complexity and the need for systems biology in the 80s. And the world wasn't ready for it at that time. I put grants into NSF and NIH and they, they did terribly. And, and in part because we needed the Human Genome Project, which gave us the complete parts list. That was really a key element to systems biology. We know all the genes, and by inference, we know all the proteins. So with that in hand, 
we could then really formulate the concepts that led to systems biology. So was that the true causation in getting the rest of the world to come along and sort of understand that that complexity needed to be studied, that the, the, the genome projects and understanding the genome, or was it beyond that? Was there something else in terms of our just our evolution and thinking that sort of said, oh, you know what, he was right all along? No, it was, it, it was actually well beyond that because the genome was finished in 2000. Three, we started the Institute for Systems Biology, the first such in, in 2000, and enormous skepticism. I mean, people said it was hype, people said it was never going to amount to anything. How could you waste all, all this good money? And of course, uh, two years ago, there was a National Academy report that said, the future is systems biology, and this is how we're going to solve of most of the problems in life science. Yes. Speaking of uh, complexity and, and money, obviously we're taking a few a look right now at what the, the labs look like at the Institute for Systems Biology. A lot of uh, work, a lot of gadgets, uh, a lot of really great people obviously you've got there in downtown Seattle, essentially. Downtown Seattle, 230 uh, staff, 10 faculty members, and I think we have some of the brightest, most innovative, uh, creative people that come from all disciplines. We have people in astrophysics that have come into biology, computer science, theoretical physics, engineering, chemistry. We've mixed them all together in a, in a beautiful blend, and they've learned to communicate with one another, learned different languages, and they've learned to work effectively on teams to solve hard problems. So if, as you look back now on the struggles and, and on getting people to go along with you, how vindicated do you feel that people have come along? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I felt from day one that I was totally right. <laughs> and it was just going to take the world a while to catch up. And so, so it's nice now to recognize that the world uh, really sees that this is the future. But the challenge, of course, is you don't want to stand still. So what's the next big innovation that we're we'll going to We'll get right invent? back to what's next with Dr. Leroy Hood when we return. It's really exciting time to be doing PR. Now we're finally doing the public and public relations. What's changed for us is that there's so many more ways to tell stories today. Brands and companies should be their own media outlets. People are engaging online. And that is creating a movement. I think Weber Shamwick is in a great position to capitalize and, and serve clients in all different types of ways. We're back with Dr. Leroy Hood. Lee, when you look at what you're trying to do from a medical point of view, you seem to stress wellness over health care. What's the difference? That's really a great question that we can't answer uh, very easily. In fact, it's probably best answered by saying, I know it when I see it, right? Right. But I think the essence is that in the past, the healthcare system has focused almost entirely on dealing with you after you got sick. What we're learning now from some of these systems approaches is that we can actually optimize and improve wellness of the individual. So we'd like now to get the healthcare system engaged in, in really doing two things, optimizing wellness for each individual and minimizing disease. It strikes me you might have another struggle on your hands <laughs> for the ages <laughs> if you want to deal with the healthcare industry and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe your business model isn't quite right and we're going to turn it upside down. Well, it, you're right. I mean, first of all, physicians tend to be enormously conservative. And in fact, the healthcare community is a, is a pretty conservative uh, endeavor. But I think what's going to drive this new type of healthcare are patients. And I think specifically what's going to drive it are patient activated social networks. Patients are now getting together, for example, in networks called the quantified self, where they use these digital gadgets that can measure various of your parameters, how well you sleep, how much exercise you've had. And they're doing self-learning together to optimize their wellness. And they're going to their physicians and saying, you don't know anything about this. Isn't it about time you started learning about wellness as well as disease? And these are 
specific medical social networks. These are casual social networks because they might have a Nike device or they might have their smartphone measuring their heartbeat as they're jogging. And then they come back and report back on Facebook or Twitter to their friends and say, hey, how are you doing? And by doing that, they measure each other and they talk about it and they give encouragement to each other. So are those the social networks you're referring to from a health point of view? They are. In fact, they got started from Wired magazine in 2008 when they advocated the quantified self. Right, I remember that and, article. And creating those networks, and they've spread all around the United States now, and some of them are quite remarkable in what they've learned. So I love this idea that people, and this is participatory from your four Ps, exactly. might help drive this move towards wellness and drag the healthcare industry along with it. How important are these I, devices? I would delete the might. Okay. I think the people <laughs> are going to drive the new healthcare. Got yeah. it. Yeah. And, and the tools, it sounds the technology is actually instrumental in this in, in addition to the, the will of the people because right. they now can do this because they've got these smart devices with them. They've got their social networks. We have cloud computing. So uh, is it inevitable? Is it happening right now? It's beginning to happen right now, absolutely. And it isn't just the digital devices and the things they measure. It's also integrating that data with your medical history, with your medical records, and, and with your environmental history, too. And as well, uh, at ISB, for example, we're developing new kinds of clinical assays that let us explore completely new dimensions of patient data space that are really exciting. For example, your entire genome sequence now gives us deep insights into your potential, again, for optimizing wellness and minimizing disease. It strikes me that the success of some of this in this approach, these four Ps you talk about, and wellness, does reside a bit on access to that very personal data that we have and, and making that open. From a privacy point of view, that might make some people feel uncomfortable. How do you deal with that? What argument can you make to say it should be open? You know what the most compelling argument is? It is, look, society has created the resources that give us these powerful tools that will, in a few years, give us a virtual cloud of billions of data points around every single patient. And from that, we'll be able to optimize wellness, minimize disease. It is your moral obligation to make those data available so that qualified researchers can mine that for the predictive medicine of the future. And the key is, it's gonna improve healthcare for your kids and your grandkids. And you have a moral role to helping make that happen. And I won't be deprived of insurance by my company if they say, wait a minute, we looked at your data and we realize that you've got that defect so we can't insure you there. So uh, that is a really important point. We've already started to make laws that begin to eliminate some of those biases, but we have to strengthen them. And it is really critical that you, you, you must not be taken advantage of by your employer, by your, your insurance company, or even by your family. Okay. Well, you know what? After the break, we'll talk to Dr. Hood about what it was like to meet the president. We're back with Dr. Leroy Hood from the Institute for Systems Biology. How did you come to Seattle in the first place, Dr. Hood? I came to Seattle because at Caltech, I really wanted to start a new type of biology department that was cross-disciplinary in nature with all the flavors of scientists brought together and focused on hard problems in biology. The biologists at Caltech were unenthusiastic oh, no. about this. You're constantly but, fighting resistance, it seems. <laughs> but Bill Gates really made it possible. He gave the new department an endowment of $12 million that made it possible to get started up here, and that's how I came to Seattle. And I was wondering, that strikes me, was that before the Gates Foundation had even been created, that Bill Gates wanted you to be here anyway and sort of do this good work in the Seattle area? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. I actually think probably it was Mary Gates, uh, as much mom. as Bill Gates, yes. who was really pushing uh, Bill to help the university with something significant that he liked. And, and uh, so I got inva invited to come up and give three dance lectures to which uh, at Bill the University of Washington. went at the University of Washington. He went, and then at the end of that period, we had a dinner atop the Columbia Towers and talked about what the future could be. I mean, despite everything you're doing now, you still feel okay being here in Seattle? Or do you have what you need to continue the innovation that you're doing? I think there are a few other places that a lot of what we've done would have been possible. Okay. 
And from Bill Gates to Barack Obama, I'm just going to play a little video of you uh, receiving the uh, Medal of Science, correct, from, from Barack Obama. This was a couple of months ago. What was it like to be honored in such a way by the country? I think the most exciting part of the Medal of Honor ceremony was meeting Barack Obama. I mean, he strode up on the, uh, on, on, uh, to the podium. He gave an absolutely wonderful lecture that was enormously relevant, laced with, uh, with humor. And then after the ceremony was over, he met with us individually for pictures and together with our family. So we had 30 seconds to uh, <laughs> interact with him. It wasn't enough time to give him good advice. But, but did you get uh, a sense that he actually knew of your work and uh, found it valuable? I, I, he, I think he, he knew a little bit about each of the uh, Medal Honors that was there, yeah, honorees. And it was, yeah, it was a very, very special occasion. You know, uh, there's been a lot of political talk about the role of science in this country, and there are some who sort of accuse certain politicians of waging a war on science and whether our educational um, sort of infrastructure can actually support the kind of education we need for innovation. Um, does this kind of recognition point a, a different way forward for our country? The fact that scientists are being recognized like you at this point says there might be some kind of future for innovation and in science education in the United States? Well, one of the things that I'm certain of is that Obama really does respect science and technology, and he's really committed to seeing it uh, uh, um, experience uh, the good times in spite of sequestration and right. many other things that are happening. I mean, I think I think one of the struggles we have today is just the political paralysis that comes from uh, polarization. And I'm not sure there's any president that could manage much better than Barack Obama has done. But I think we're all hoping that this will end sometime and we can get back on the true course. And my gut feeling about Obama is he's committed to that uh, future. And you're, you're looking at your future, a lifetime award. This is the equivalent of a lifetime award, if, like if you get right. an, a lifetime right. award as an actor. You know, this, you should be at the peak of your powers, culmination of your work. You should just be hitting the golf course now, but you're not, are you? Why don't you just stop? This is, you've done so much. Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's actually infectious once you, uh, so I've been involved in a whole series of paradigm changes that have changed biology, the uh, developing new technologies, the genome project, creating the Institute for Systems Biology, and, and this new kind of medicine we'll probably talk about a little bit later. And it's infectious when you see how you can formulate concepts that can fundamentally change the world if you have the capability to bring them to, to fruition and reality. Well, that's what I find most laudable, your motivation and your drive and the fact that you see it as, as never-ending work, which, and, and obviously it brings joy to you as well, so that's, that's really wonderful. So we'll be right back with Dr. Leroy Hood from the Institute for System Biology. Four Peaks is made possible by generous support from Weber Shandwick. We're back with a man of innovation, Dr. Leroy Hood. Lee, if, if we had to look 10 or 15 years down the road and what healthcare or wellness looks like for an individual, what do you think is going to be different? Is this, are we living in science fiction in 10 or 15 years from now? You know, I think the thing that's going to be different is there'll be a wellness industry that will far exceed the current healthcare industry. Everyone is going to be focused on optimizing their wellness and improving it and living to the maximum of their genetic and environmental potential. Is that mean we'll be living, all living past 100? You know, I think what it will mean is we'll live productive, intellectually alert, physically active lives right up probably into the 90s. And it's absolutely going to be fascinating because that will require a fundamental sociologic change. How do we deal with retirement? How do we deal with jobs for young people? I think society is going to have to be restructured in major ways. Hmm. But one of the things I'll guarantee you is, you know, genetic reasonability in keeping, you can be active and productive and functional into your 90s. And I think that's an incredibly exciting possibility because you've got this enormous lifetime of experience that you'll have behind you to be 
excellent at whatever you wish. And the primary reason for that ability and that longevity is because suddenly we have access to our personal information, both in terms of how we're doing as well as what's going on inside us, and then we can make the changes necessary. It's about behavioral change and the information that inspires that behavioral change. Is that, is that correct? That's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is we'll deal with diseases that are plagues now. Cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurologic diseases. We'll, we'll be in a position to begin eliminating those kinds of uh, consequences. So that, it's, it's eliminating disease, and it's optimizing wellness. That's super exciting. I mean, I hope I'm around long enough to benefit from that. It's a, a, you will be. Really? Absolutely. And how about you? Do you feel like you're, you're, I mean, you're very healthy, you work out, you must feel like you're gonna be part of this for a I'm long I'm gonna be time. a part of this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And if you had to sort of, if, if you looked at yourself and said, you know, if I were free of all obligation and expectation in my life, despite everything you've accomplished, is there something you'd like to do differently or do right now, free of everything you have? Uh, I'd like to do better what I'm doing right now. What I really, my, my vision for the future is that we can really have this systems medicine or P4 medicine accepted and it will be the framework uh, for the medicine that all people will, will, will have access to in the future. That tells me that not only this is, this is your life's work, but this is your life's passion as well. It is. There's nothing it else is. other than this in terms of obviously you have your family and, your, and whoever you love, but this work is your life. It, it is my life. And, and I think working at problems like this is what keeps you young. You've clearly done a very good job of it. I hope I can find that same, that same obsession slash passion to keep uh -huh. me going as well. Uh -huh. So Dr. Leroy Hood, wellness and science pioneer, thank you very much for joining us. We invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us at fourpeaks.org. I'm Hanson Hossein. Production of Four Peaks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors.